Uh, welcome. It's uh, great to be here. As Maureen mentioned, um, these are sort of my old stomping grounds. I don't think I ever actually taught in this classroom, but uh, I spent about 13 years at NYU before um, moving on to, to be the dean of the, the business school at George Washington University. And my main area of work uh, back when I was a professor was um, on China. Now, I just have to start with the caveat. It's a little bit of a painful thing, uh, pain and pleasure for me um, to come back and give talks on China. Um, one of the, the difficult things about, um, about being a professor and then a dean is when you're a professor, uh, you desperately want people to care about what you say. So you're doing all of this research, and you're churning out all of this good work, and nobody really cares what most professors say, to be honest. But then when you're a dean, and you have no time to do research on what you really cared about, people actually always ask you to give talks. And so now I'm always talking now on stuff that I don't know as much as, about as I used to. So it's just one of those things. Um, but I do try to keep up. Uh, we have a big presence in China now, just as NYU does. GW is, is doing similar kinds of things. And so I spend a lot of time thinking about what's happening in the China market. Um, and in particular, because of my collaboration with, with um, Maureen and Scott, um, I've gotten to think about the context for things like consumer goods and in particular luxury goods and really think about what it actually means for the type of work that I do. So in order to set the stage for today, I want to give first a little primer on how to think about economic development in China. Um, economic development in China is a very complex system, complex infrastructure, and to really understand it, um, I think you kind of have to take a step back and understand what has happened over the course of the last 30-some years to give rise to this economic juggernaut, because that points a direction for really understanding how to strategically enter this market. Okay? And then uh, towards the end, I'm going to talk about the, what I think are the major threats for luxury goods in general um, uh, with respect to the China market right now. So without that further ado, I will dive in. Um, so how do we think about the China market, and how should we understand it? Well, one thing that is very clear, uh, and this is not news to anybody, but this is the greatest economic development story of certainly of the 20th and 21st century, but potentially the greatest one ever when we sort of think about how it has come to be the case that since 1979, we had a country that was not just at a third world level of development, but the political infrastructure was destroyed. This is a place that had no legal infrastructure, and the Cultural Revolution had left it in just tatters. And in 30 years, it has grown to be the second largest economy in the world. And sometime around 2016, 2017, it will eclipse our economy as the largest economy in the world. Now, people will be quick to remind that by per capita GDP, China is not anywhere near the United States. And of course, that's true. But just in terms of overall size and infrastructure, this is going to be the largest economy in the world. Barring some kind of catastrophic war or whatever uh, could stop the global economy from developing the way it does, this will happen. Now, what that actually means and how that has actually occurred are, are two very interesting and important questions. And I'm going to talk about both of those. But both of those inform the story that is before us. Now, the numbers are interesting, but this is really what we're looking at, right? This is, in some ways, whenever I deal with executives, you know, I give talks about China all the time, and most of the time I say, look, the numbers are interesting, the story's interesting, but most of all, you just gotta go see. You gotta go stand on the bund and look out across and imagine that 25 years ago, besides that TV tower, none of that existed. It was rice fields and broken down factories. Right? And that, that is a story that's not just on Shanghai's Bund. It is all over the country. In Suzhou, there is a place that called the Suzhou Industrial Park that was truly just rice fields in 1993. Today, there is 50 million square feet of Class A office space. To put that in perspective, Washington, DC has 60 million square feet of Class A office space. It has the same population as Washington, DC. Essentially, they built a city in 20 years that looks like some of our top cities. Right? And so it's just an amazing economic development story. But where does it come from? Now, the images of China 
are many and diverse. And I always, as a, as a sociologist and somebody who thinks about economics in the context of history, I always like to take a step back and think historically, what have we been through? Where are we going? Uh, and there are lots of images that come from the confrontation between the West and China in the 16th and 17th century to the rise of Mao Zedong uh, and to the conversion of a communist society into a true capitalist society. But the story really starts here with Deng Xiaoping. Deng Xiaoping came to the United States in 1979 as the new leader of a country that was, had been torn apart by the Cultural Revolution of Mao. He came, he sat down with Jimmy Carter, he signed the Normalization Agreement, he went to a John Denver concert, and then he visited a couple of other cities that, that's true, he went to a John Denver concert. <laughs> they gave him a cowboy hat and he put it on and sang Country Roads, it was very cute. Um, but he visited three other cities. He first went to Atlanta, because he knew that if you were going to build a high class, number one economy, you needed a consumer based economy. So who should we visit but Coca Cola? Then he went to Seattle, because he knew that if you were going to build a number one dominant economy, you need high tech infrastructure, not Microsoft type infrastructure. You need high tech manufacturing infrastructure that a company like Boeing could help deliver. And then he went to Houston because he knew that if you want to have a dominant economy, you better have an aeronautics program and you better be able to launch rockets. So you better visit NASA. Right? And that kind of tells you just how much foresight this guy had. There are two people in all of the, the, the history of the last 32 years of economic reform that I think are the key political figures that has transformed this nation and thereby transformed the world. They are Deng Xiaoping and a name that you will hear less. Uh, Zhu Rongji, who was the premier of China, of China from 1992 to 2002. They are the individuals that set this whole ship in motion. But the real story of economics and the global trade begins here. Now, most people don't recognize this picture because this was taken and put printed on page 17 of the New York Times on September 17, 2001. At that time, we had a lot of other things on our mind, and China quietly made its way into the WTO and entered the world of nations in which it could no longer be held back by the United States in particular as becoming an equal par trading partner. China, what I mean by that is the United States, through a lot of political shenanigans, really kept China out of the World Trade Organization for over a decade. And so when China entered the WTO, this became a moment that, in which people on the political side uh, saw some things happening, but more importantly, people on the economic side really felt the tremors. And then, of course, we have a number of things that, in which politics and economics really converge. And this becomes a very, very uh, important relationship that culminated most recently in the coming out story of what was probably the greatest party ever thrown around the world. There were so many people saying that this was going to be a failed event. Uh, but then, of course, um, what you heard later was the people who were organizing the London Olympics were just shaking in their, in their beds because it was impossible to eclipse what was done on this story. And people started to step up and say, what is really going on here from an economic standpoint? Nevertheless, what I like to call the doom and gloom view of China still prevails. Um, you see it, it, massive amount of information and literature put out in popular presses that's really about, this is a house of cards. It's falling apart. There is environmental degradation that is just a disaster. Um, there is a huge trade imbalance. There are terrible things like political tensions that go back to images of 1989 and even are alive and well today. There's the currency issue, which is one of the silliest debates in the world today. And it just makes really no sense to even talk about it. But it's a much easier thing to blame China for currency manipulations than it is to think deeply about what's wrong with our own economy. Uh, there's, of course, things like Fo Foxconn. And then there's the famous issues of corruption uh, with cases like Bo Xilai. Um, so the real question then is, given all of that, given all of those images, how should we understand where China is and what are the real aspects of what we need to know? Now, one of the things that I always like to start out, and when I'm talking to people who think about economic development and trade, is we need to always remember that we are not at the end point of a cycle of globalization the way we typically think. We have shipped about $3 trillion out the door. And we've benefited from that by having cheap goods that come back into our economy. However, the problem with that is that China now sits on more foreign exchange reserves than any other country by a factor of about three. 
That money must come back here for our economy to do well. It has to be reinvested. Uh, and I'll talk in a little bit about what the problems are with that reinvestment, but it's a very necessary part of that cycle. So if we think about China as this place where there's so many massive problems, how should we actually understand what is my view, which is that China is actually one of the greatest success stories, and it's not just one because of deep, cheap labor pools. It's actually one that is a success story because of institutional innovation. So I'm going to go through these things very quickly. I think they're important things to think about, and they have implications for how you think about doing business in this economy. But bear in mind that this isn't just a story of cheap labor, in my view. This is a story of true institutional innovation about how an economy should be run. And it's something that, that we, as you know, the self-proclaimed masters of the market, the greatest capitalist country in the world, uh, we should actually sit, sit up and learn about how to design a, a healthy market economy from the largest communist society in the world, um, which is a bit of an irony. So gradualism. This is the first important point to think about with respect to China. China has not gone through the standard economic development practice that most nations that were making the transition from communism or planned market economy to a market economy have done. It has turned that process on its head. And it's a very, very gradual, frustratingly slow, but it's an experimental process. The way institutional reform happens in China is that China doesn't begin with an institutional proclamation that's ideologically driven the way we do and then filter it down into law. Instead, what it does is it throws out ideas that are experiments in the market, has those filter back up, and then law is codified on the back end. So to give you an example, when people were frustrated in the 1990s because China still didn't have a labor law, they were saying, oh, this is the autocratic leaders in Beijing who don't want to have human rights. Actually, China had been experimenting with labor contracts since 1983, getting feedback from all of the provinces and building a law from the ground up in that way. This is what it does with every piece of legislation that's passed in China. The good news is that that allows for a tremendous amount of flexibility and and experimentation. So it's very good for China. The bad news is that when you're trying to do business in China, it's a mess. It is very difficult, because when you put gradualism together with the next most important thing, the thing that I call the secret sauce of China's success story, it is the issue of decentralization. So many people, when they think of China, they think of Beijing. And they think about laws and proclamations that come out of Beijing. They think about political leaders that negotiate in Beijing. This is a myth. Of course, those people exist, but they have very little power. China is actually a more decentralized economy than the federalist state system of the United States. So when you want to understand what has happened in China, you have to actually understand what's happened in thousands of pockets throughout China. Now, the reason they did this is that this is how they were allowed, they were able to create a viable and vibrant market economy without rapid privatization. Com the, the, the capitalist minds, the great economists of the West, actually have it wrong. Private property is not the cornerstone of a capitalist market economy. Competition is. There are lots of cases of oligopolist firms, some in our own economy, that we know are very, very inefficient because they don't have the right level of competition. There are lots of state-owned organizations across the globe, many of them in China, that are very dynamic because they do have competition. And this is a local kind of competition in state-driven systems that are local governments. Now here again, the good news is that there are a lot of interesting dynamic local governments out there that are just radical movers in the market economy. The bad news is there are also a lot of bad ones. And the worst news is that how to actually understand where the good places and the bad places are takes a tremendous amount of work. You can't just have a China strategy that says, I'm going to Shanghai, we're setting up a rep office, and it's all going to be great from there. You have to actually understand local markets and local governments. And it's just a very, very difficult thing. The one thing I would say about this is another mistake that a lot of firms make is they focus very much, overwhelmingly so, on the biggies. Beijing, Shanghai, Guangzhou, Hong Kong. The real action in China is in tier two cities. This is where most of the wealth creation is happening. It's where most of the dynamic governments are. It's in places like Suzhou, Chengdu, Xi'an, Dalian. These are the places that if you're thinking about strategies in China, you have to get to know. I've talked a little bit about Suzhou already, and I want to just move quickly because I want to get to the, the things that are the biggest concern. There's a couple of things to think about in terms of of attracting capital. China has been very good at attracting capital, but there is always a quid pro quo 
in attracting capital. And that quid pro quo is essentially you must transfer your brand knowledge, your technology. So you can make money here for a while, but pretty soon we're going to take you over. They think like this in industrial markets. They think like this in consumer markets. They think like this in education. And so it's just part of doing business in China. Um, there is also a very important thing about cross-industry strategizing. And here is where I think the United States could learn a lot from China. We typically think that markets just need to be left alone, and any governmental interference is just bad for markets. The problem with that is that markets left alone inevitably fail. And you can think about government involvement only as regulation, but if you look at the Chinese case, there's a lot of government involvement that's very dynamic and entrepreneurial. But what government involvement gives you is cross-industry strategizing, which is a very, very important of any large-scale market economy. Public-private partnerships are also a very important thing here. And so it's crucial, really, to think about how you can actually develop a, a dynamic system that has this kind of government-level cross-industry strategizing while at the same time uses the, the vibrancy of the marketplace. One irony is, just as a side note, we used to be great at this in this country. We became one of the dominant country, the, the, the dominant economy in the world through public-private partnerships. How do you think the entire automobile industry was built? It was built through public-private partnerships and subsidies to roads and oil. Right? And so we have you know, sort of lost our sense of how those things actually happen, and I think it's a shame. There's also a tremendous amount of money sitting out of there. I mentioned already uh, the foreign exchange reserves, but there's a tremendous amount of money sitting out there in sovereign wealth funds. China has some of that, but there are a number of others. But if you look at the money that's coming back, this is a travesty for our nation. This is a ridiculous number. Some of this is because of the, the real level of interference that we get from the federal government through CFIUS, but some of it is just because there's a big cultural gap here, and it's one that needs to be bridged. There's a lot of famous companies that have dealt with that. Some have done horribly, like Huawei, and some have done well, like CNOC. Now, the final thing is I just want to point to politics and what we need to know, and then I'm going to dive into what the big threats are. Okay? This is an interesting political moment for us all. Um, in many ways, uh, I hadn't realized what was so wrong over the last 10 years, because I've always been known as the guy who's bullish on China. Uh, but over the last 10 years, things seemed to be getting worse and worse and worse. And part of the problem was that Zhu Rongji was a great leader. So Zhu Rongji and Jiang Zemin were the leaders of the 90s and early 2000s. Zhu Rongji was the, the genius that set everything in motion about radical reform. Um, that then had a momentum of its own carrying to about 2005. The problem is that Hu Jintao and Wen Jiabao have been a disaster. These guys are not good economists. They don't understand how to run a market economy, and they're not respected by the provinces. And so it's been a disaster, but it's been slow in unwinding, so it's been difficult to see. But the last couple of years, it's been quite clear. Uh, you also see this with the corruption scandals of people like Bo Xilai and the amount of corruption that has come back in China after it was sort of on its way to being fixed in the late 1990s and early 2000s. So it's a really, really critical time. We're starting to see things that look good to me. Xi Jinping and Li Keqiang you know, have been really, really held their cards close. And so we haven't known exactly what they were going to be like. But I actually think that the signs are much better. Um, and then finally, as a part of that, we need to think about just how much this revolution towards democratization is happening. I am a firm believer in the fact that it is happening, and China doesn't get nearly enough credit for how radical the democratic reforms are. But again, this last decade has, uh, I think, slowed it down from what the original projections were that I would have given you a year ago, or 10 years ago. Now, I want to talk specifically about the, the five, what I see are the, in that context, what are the five great threats? to the luxury market in particular. And this is probably threats to the whole market in general, but a couple of them are specific to consumerism and the luxury market. The first thing, just to come off this last point, is political uncertainty. Um, I actually just don't know what Xi Jinping and Li Keqiang are going to be like. Uh, the early signs look good, um, but there is a huge unknown here. We just don't have any idea of how well these guys are going to do in taking us back to the kind of economic development, the thoughtful economic development that was occurring uh, under the regime of Jiang Zemin and Zhu Rongji. We'll have to see. And so I don't have a good answer for that. Again, I think things look fairly positive. Um, 
There are lots of sort of reading the tea leaf kinds of things that you can see with Xi Jinping that make him look like he's actually going to be more out of the cloth of Deng Xiaoping and Zhu Rongji. Uh, but we're going to have to see. And, and there's a lot of work to do to repair the damage that was done by Hu Jintao and Wen Jiabao. The second issue is related to the decentralization question. One big problem <coughs> that China has right now is that it has become so decentralized that you have these pockets of local economies, again, some of which are great, some of which are very non-corrupt and operate really efficiently, and some of which are just cesspools. Okay? And you just you have to figure out where the, these are. Now, one of the big challenges there is that ultimately, if you're going to become a great economy, in some sectors, you have to build a national economy. Take, for example, something like steel. You cannot be competitive in steel which is an essential backbone of several industries, from construction to automobiles, unless you actually have national champions. Now, there is one national champion in China, but most of the steel industry is based on provincial level producers. And they all compete with each other, and they're all suboptimal. They're not that good. And so if China is going to be a great economy, there's going to have to be more of this cross-provincial strategizing the same way they do cross-industry strategizing. It's going to be a challenge, and we'll see how it plays out. Um, further digital isolation, and this is a particularly interesting thing for, for people like Maureen and Scott and L2 to be thinking about. Um, the reason Google got out of China is not because of politics or political uncertainty or any kind of moral stance. It is because they were getting beat up by Baidu. And when you start to think about what's happening here, I sort of thought I was always among, among the mindset that once this opening up starts, you're going to get more and more convergence. We are not seeing more and more convergence. We are seeing China build a completely parallel system. Now, the good news is that if you think like L2 Think, think Tank and you think, how do we figure this out? How do we figure out how to help clients crack this? And you're one of those clients that's doing that well, good for you. The bad news is that having no, no convergence is incredibly inefficient. If you're a company and you have to think about having your div, digital footprint and then it works for the entire world, but you can't use Facebook and Twitter and everything else over here, it's not efficient. It's very, very bad. And eventually, companies are going to, they're just going to say, you know what, this isn't worth it. And so I think it's actually a real risk for the luxury market and for the digital market. Flight of capital. This is probably the greatest un unknown black box threat to China today. There are so many wealthy families that want desperately to get their money and get their families out of China just because of the uncertainty that they face. Right? There's a little program called, any, anybody ever hear of the EB-5 program? EB-5 is, a, is an economic development program. I actually do a lot of work with developers on this. Um, if you're wealthy enough, you don't even have to have that much money, $500,000, you can invest, get a green card, get on a plane, and move to the United States. There are a number of people from you know, the, the million dollar net worth to the billion dollar net worth group <coughs> who are involved in these kind of programs. And we're going to start to see the exodus the way we did uh, with parts of southern China to Canada uh, decades ago. Um, this is a big thing because this has major implications for the luxury market and has major implications for the building of a consumer-based economy in China. It's an interesting time for it as well because it looked like around 2001, 2002, China really benefited from the higher immigration uh, standards and difficulties that they were experiencing in the United States. And we were starting to see a reverse brain drain. Right? The economy here was having difficulty, lots of vibrant ex opportunities in China, kids returning to China and taking advantage of it. Today, here again, the political uncertainty plays, uh, comes back to bite China. And there's a lot of people who's, who are involved with the flight of capital. We don't even know what the numbers are. And the final thing is the question of how long the growth is sustainable. And here, just one key thing to understand about China is that it is essential that China build a consumer-based economy, not just because that has a nice feedback loop, but because you cannot continue to build an economy the way China does, which is mostly led through state investment. That works if you believe Dwight Perkins, who's an old China economist and I think one of the, the best thinkers in this area. He basically makes the case that any developing country basically tops out in terms of being able to be, have investment-led growth at about 13,000 GDP per capita GDP, right? 
China's at about 6,000 per capita GDP right now. But once it hits 13,000, if it follows the model of every other nation, it's going to hit a plateau. And then there's going to be very little growth beyond that unless the growth comes from a consumer-based economy. That we don't know. We just have to wait and see whether that happens. And it's clear that it's on the leader's, leader's uh, agenda. It's unclear whether they know how to do it. Uh, and so those are the two things. Numbers four and five, I think, actually relate very closely. Um, but they are all big risks for this market. So I'm going to uh, end my comments there. Um, I think probably we don't have much time for questions. Maybe we have time for one, one or two questions if there are immediate ones. Uh, but then we'll come back and do some questions at the end. Are there any immediate questions that people want to talk in terms of clarification? Yeah? Yes, please. Sure. So the question is about cross-industry strategizing. What does that mean? Do I have an example? Um, so I'll start, give you two quick examples. In the United States, industry groups, which were some were, were private, so there were meetings of CEOs in the Washington, D.C. The group, the Federal City Council, was a big one. Uh, but usually there were these kinds of industry groups that got together and thought about the direction of the economy and how the economy is actually in, unfolding. And then industrial policy, which included industrial policy for manufacturing, for labor, and for, for things like energy, would come together through the cabinets of the government and actually sort of think about what are our plans for the economy and how do we actually think about the threats. We don't do that today in this country. In China, there is a, a governmental body called the State-Owned Asset Supervision and Administration Commission. There's both a government level, but there's also one at every provincial level. And this is essentially a government body, but it's, it acts like a portfolio manager of all of the largest national champion companies. And so what they are able to do is think at a much more macro level is what is in the best interest of what our strategies are for economic development and how does that affect the different companies that are involved here. So what happens then in very practical terms, I've seen this with executives that all the time when particularly those in say the oil industry that are competing with China uh, for, for contracts in, in Africa. So they'll say, we just can't compete with China Inc. It's unfair. It's not market process to have these state subsidized companies that then can come in and not just give you uh, an oil contract, but they can give you a development contract, an air contract, and uh, bring in financing. How can we compete with that? It's not bad competition. It's smart competition. The problem with us is that we don't, I mean, in the West, where we have this much more fractured view of it, is that we don't actually coordinate across industries. And that's very deleterious to how we actually are competing.